My name is Yue Xichen. You can call me Louis. So happy to be here to talk about slab slab feng shui in the Linux kernel. If time allows, I will also include some techniques to bypass Linux kernel mitigations in this talk. At the very beginning, I'd like to show a minute, spare a minute to introduce myself and my collaborators. Again, my name is Louis. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm a PhD student from Penn State doing exploitation and vulnerability analysis. I'm looking for the next year's summer internship in both academia and industry. If you know of any suitable positions, please contact me. The guy in the middle is Xin Yu, my advisor at Penn State. He's also a visiting scholar at JD.com, one of the biggest e-commerce companies in the world. The man in the rightmost is Jimmy. He is a director of a security research center in Silicon Valley of JD.com. Jimmy looks so angry. <laughs> Since I'm talking about slab slab feng shui, I'd like to uh, first briefly introduce the working fashion of them. In the kernel, dynamic memory is organized into slab cache, which is basically uh, continuous pages. Each slab cache is divided into slots for holding objects. Three slots are organized into a single list with a hat pointer. For allocation, I'm sorry, what's uh, okay. For allocation, the kernel holds the object by retrieving a slot from the free list head. Then the head pointer moves towards the next slot in the list. Objects in the, in the same slab cache are of similar size or in the same slab type. For deallocation, the kernel recycles it back to the head and updates the head pointer. In this way, slab slab allocator works in a first in, last out fashion. And both allocation and deallocation occur at the freest head. Let's see the widely adopted exploitation approach for use of the free vulnerability in the Linux kernel. At the very beginning, the vulnerable object possesses a slot and encloses a function pointer targeting a benign address. The kernel visits the fields of the vulnerable object via a pointer. We can exploit the uh, use of the free vulnerability in three steps. In the first step, the vulnerable object is freed and the slot holding it is recycled for following allocations. The dangling pointer occurs and is not nullified. The adversaries can continue to visit the freed memory including the function pointer. At this moment, the function pointer still targets a benign address. In the second step, the adversaries perform heap spray to allocate an object to the same slot as a vulnerable object and overwrite its function pointer to a malicious address. Finally, in the third step, we dereference the overwritten function pointer via the dangling pointer to hijack the kernel execution. The workflow of slab auto bound write exploitation is slightly similar. The overflow, represented in shadow, corrupts the vulnerable object in green as well as the following memory region in the slab. We can also exploit this auto bound write in three steps. The first step is to allocate a victim object in red, which encloses a function pointer next to the vulnerable object. At this moment, the function pointer targets a benign address. In the second step, we trigger the security bug to overwrite the function pointer to a malicious address. Finally, in the third step, we dereference the function pointer to hijack the kernel execution to disable mitigations and, and escalate privilege. Even with these widely adopted exploitation approaches for use of the free, and uh, slab auto bound write, it is still challenging to craft an exploit. The first challenge is to determine which objects are useful for a given security bug. The victim object, the vulnerable object, and the spray object should be of similar size or in the same step, uh, or in the same, same type to be allocated to the same slab cache. 
Besides, the victim object should enclose a function pointer or other sensitive data, and their offsets should be within the memory corruption range so that we can corrupt them during exploitation. For spray object, the, con the content of it must be controllable so that we can use it for overwrite. The second challenge is how to allocate, deallocate, and dereference the kernel object using system call sequence and arguments. As object operations happen inside the kernel, the direct interface between kernel space and user space is system call. The third challenge is how to manipulate slab to obtain desired layout. Along with the allocations of the vulnerable object, the victim object, and the spray object, other objects can be allocated or freed, generating side effect to the slab layout. The possible layouts can vary case by case, and we'll summarize them into two situations. The first situation is the target slot is unoccupied while the victim object is allocated to another slot. The second situation is the target slot is taken over by a side effect object. Both situations influence the slab layout, and thus the function pointer will not be overwritten as expected when corruption happens. It is not easy to eliminate the side effect because in a single system call, the vulnerable object and the side effect object can be allocated sequentially making it difficult to correct the layout through racing. All the challenges I listed so far are very common in developing exploits for slab-based vulnerabilities, not only for use of the free uh, and the slab out of bound right, but also for other types, such as uh, double free. To tackle the three challenges, we build a kernel object database which, in which we record kernel objects useful for exploitation, as well as system calls and corresponding arguments to allocate, deallocate, and dereference them. This addresses change one and change two. I will describe the details in the first part of this roadmap. In the second part, I will explain how we adjust slab layout systematically to, over oh, to overcome challenges three where a side effect happens. Finally, in the third part, I will go through some tricks that may interest you. I also have a demo session for you so that you can gain some hands-on experience. Following existing research works, one straightforward solution to change one and change two is to boot up the kernel and run regression test. We monitor the allocation, deallocation, and the reference of objects in the kernel and colorate them to the system calls invoked in the regression test suite. While this solution works well for use user space programs, we cannot apply it directly to the kernel. The first reason is the kernel's huge code base. After booting up the system, there are hundreds of thousands of objects and nearly one million pointers. The number of objects is much larger than that in user space programs. While not, all of, while not all of them are useful. Additionally, the Linux kernel has over 300 system calls with various combinations of arguments, which is also a huge search space. To make things worse, system calls are not independent. For example, if you want to send a network message, you need, you need to be, build a socket in advance. The complex runtime context further increases the difficulty. The second reason is the Linux kernel runs in an asynchronous fashion. As an example, the read-copy-update mechanism first registers a function pointer while delays its dereference after a grace period. When seeing such dereference, we have already lost the clue for where the function pointer is registered. The third reason is the Linux kernel is a multitask system. User space processors, kernel threads, as well as hardware interrupt can trigger kernel execution, which also operate objects, generating noise and failing the straightforward solution. Considering all these constraints, we proposed a better solution to resolve both challenges. Our solution first uses static analysis to identify useful objects. 
From the source code, we learn the program sites where identified objects are allocated, deallocated, and dereferenced. Along the kernel call graph, we trace from the sites of interest back to the system call system calls that can potentially reach these sites. Static analysis offers us the information about which, which kernel objects are useful as well as which system calls we can use to operate these objects. To eliminate false positives of static analysis and complete the system calls with arguments, we run kernel fuzzing to trigger the object operations in runtime. In static analysis, we focus on two types of objects that are useful for exploitation. The first type is victim object, which typically has a function pointer or a data object pointer. Attackers can overwrite these pointers to a malicious code address or a fake object prepared in advance so as to hijack control flow. We define the dereference sites as a program statement where indirect call happens. Considering asynchronous callbacks, we also overlook calling to functions like k rcu which registers a callback the reference to free the object. The second type is spray object, which most of the content can be controlled. Kernel invokes functions like copy from user to migrate data from user space to kernel space. Leveraging this feature, the adversaries can prepare exploit payload and have them decide in the kernel space. With the sites of interest, we build a kernel object data, we build a kernel call graph and perform reachable analysis to identify potential system calls. And the example on the right half of the slide, we can, we can tell that system call set socket option can reach the allocation site in the function IPMC join group because there is a path from the syscall entry to the allocation site. We use this result to restrict the system calls used in fuzzing so as to improve efficiency. To better serve our purpose, we customize the call graph. We delete function nodes in the initial text section from the graph because they are not used after the kernel boots up. We also delete call edges between independent modules to make the graph more accurate. We add edges of asynchronous callbacks so that sites where asynchronous dereference is registered can also, be, can also be traced. Since the call graph still involves false positives, which means not all the system calls identified can really trigger the object's operations, we run kernel fuzzing for further confirmation and completing the arguments. As I mentioned in previous slides, the kernel is a multitask system which can generate noises to our kernel fuzzing. The noises come from two sources. One source is objects of the same type in our fuzzing executor. Because we want to bind allocation, deallocation, and de dereference to the same object during exploitation, we need to distinguish the operations of other objects to prevent confusion. Another source is system calls from other processors, kernel threats, and hardware interrupts. They also trigger the kernel execution, resulting in allocation, deallocation, and dereference of kernel objects. To eliminate noises in kernel fuzzing, we instrument checking at the size of interest to examine, first, it is our fuzzing executor that manipulates the object, and second, all, man all manipulations are tied to one object. Running against version 4.15 from the modules enabled by default node configuration and 32 other modules, the static analysis identifies 124 victim objects and four spray objects. Through kernel fuzzing, we further confirm allocations of 75 objects and dereferences of nearly 30 objects. Average fuzzing time is two minutes. Till now, we have resolved chapter one and chapter two by building a kernel object database. The next challenge is to eliminate side effect on slab layout. The layout adjustment involves many possibilities. First of all, 
the desired layout depends on the vulnerability and varies case by case. Given a new vulnerability, it has a new corruption range and a different control of corruption value. Secondly, the side effect also depends on the vulnerability. For example, the numbers of allocations and deallocations in each system call can be different given a new vulnerability. The allocation order of the vulnerable object is not consistent neither. Therefore, instead of covering all possibilities case by case, we summarize them into two situations based on the position relations between the object and the target slot. The first situation is the target slot is unoccupied. Assuming that the target is the third slot in the free list, let's see why it is not occupied during exploitation. We allocate the vulnerable object possessing the first slot in the list and the head pointer moves to the second slot. Then we allocate the victim object to the second slot, leaving our target are leaving our target slot unoccupied. This side effect happens because there are too few allocations. In this case, we allocated two objects while the other of the target slot or the third. Our solution is to add more allocations before the victim object. As in the original exploitation, we allocate the vulnerable object in the first step. In the second step, however, we allocate an extra dummy object from the database we built to slide the head pointer towards the third slot. Finally, in the third step, we allocate the victim object to occupy the target slot and obtain the desired layout. Compared with the original exploitation, we add one more allocation in the second step to fix the issue. While it's easy to deal with the first situation, it requires some tricks to handle the second situation where the target slot is occupied. Assume that our target is the second slot in the list. Let's see why the victim object cannot possess our target slot. In the first step, we allocate the vulnerable object along with the side effect object which occupies, the second, which occupies our target slot. When allocating the victim object in the second step, obviously we cannot obtain the desired layout. The reason is there are too many allocations before the victim object. A straightforward solution is to reduce allocations by deallocating the set effect object. As in the original exploitation, we allocate the vulnerable object and the side effect object in the first step. In the second step, we deallocate the side effect object, popping out a free slot which saves room for the victim object. Finally, in the third step, we allocate the victim object and obtain the desired layout. While this solution looks perfect and elegant, it encounters with two problems. The first problem is the first problem is a generality, as a set effect object is closely related to the vulnerability. Given new vulnerability, we need to figure out new system calls and arguments to free the side effect object. Sorry. The second problem is a vulnerable object can also be, free, be freed along with the side effect object. It's very criti critical because Without the vulnerable object, how do we trigger the vulnerability? Alternatively, our solution is to reorganize the free list and switch the order of the target slot. We allocate three dummy objects in the first step. Then we freeze them in the order second, third, and the first. As the allocation is at the head of the, of the list, the list is reorganized. In this new list, the target slot's order is third. With this new order, we allocate the vulnerable object to a first slot and the side effect object to the, third, to the second slot. This time, the target slot is untouched because it is the third slot in the list. We allocate the victim object to possess the target slot and obtain the desired layout. We use 27 vulnerabilities to evaluate the effectiveness of our approach. 
The, ev the evaluation set consists of three types of vulnerability, including use of the free, double free, and slap out of bound right. Our goal is to obtain the control flow hijacking primitive because it is strong enough to bypass mitigations and complete an exploit. We succeed in 14 cases with public exploits and three cases without public exploits. Among the nine failure cases, six are because POC manifests limited capability. For example, overflow happens inside the vulnerable object without corrupting others. Our approach considers its capability as limited and failed to generate an exploit. This result enlightens our future work to continue exploring more capability of security bugs. For the remaining three cases, the vulnerability is in special cache in which we do not find suitable objects for exploitation. To resolve this issue, we can include more modules for analysis. After describing the key ideas, I'd like to go through some tricks in this procedure. The first trick is how to create an initial slab cache. It is important because in our layout, uh, in our layout manipulation, we assume that all slots are chained sequentially. This assumption doesn't always hold. After the kernel boots up, the objects are allocated and freed. The slot list is messed up. To deal with this, we use def defragmentation, which basically allocates a number of objects and forces the kernel to create a new slab cache in which all slots are chained sequentially. The second trick is how to calculate the side effect layout. What does the layout look like? What's the order of the target slot and how many allocations and deallocations in the side effect? We answer these questions using ftrace. We run the POC in our own mesh machine and log calling to allocations and deallocations during POC's execution. Through analyzing the lock, we can learn the order of each, each slab operation and calculate the side effect layout. The third trick is how to shorten exploit window to minimize the inference of other corner, object, uh, corner activities on layout. As I mentioned, the kernel is a multitask system. Other user space processors, kernel threads, and hardware interrupts can trigger slab activities. While we cannot control them, we can minimize their influence on layout by shortening exploit window. The trick is to put critical operation after defragmentation so that we can finish an adjustment as soon as possible. OK, demo part. Yeah, opens. Is it too small? But don't worry, I have already uh, posted it to my personal page, so you can find uh, the video from my page. So basically, we have several scripts. The connect uh, virtual machine is to connect the virtual machine and copy the two virtual machines to copy the fire, copy the exploit from the host to, to the virtual machine. Start virtual machines to boot up the kernel. We run start virtual machine to boot up the kernel. I modified the kernel a little bit to print out the address of the objects so that, so that we can see how the layout adjustment goes. After booting up the kernel, we copy the exploit to the virtual machine. Then we connect to the virtual machine and run exploit. In the exploit, the first step is to set up the environment which is basically to build out the socket and uh, open fires and uh, spray the payload to the face map. It takes uh, like about uh, 10 seconds. And the second step is to do defragmentation, which is to allocate a lot of objects to fill all the holes of the slab and force the kernel to create a new slab cache. 
And in the new slab cache, all the slots are chained sequentially. The third step is to allocate the vulnerable object to the slab. And the slab is kmalloc256. K then we allocate the victim object to the slab. And you can see the, vic the vulnerable objects, address of the vulnerable objects is here, which ends with E00. And uh, this is, and if we allocate the victim object uh, directly, we will allocate it to another slot, which ends with 200, which is not after the vulnerable object. So we, we fill an object to the slab and uh, then allocate the victim object, which, whose address is F00, which is right after the vulnerable object. And in the next step, we trigger the vulnerability to overwrite the function pointer in the victim object. And finally, we dereference the function pointer to hijack the kernel execution. And you can see the value of our IP, the program counter register, the, uh, the value right now is the FFFF and data beef, which is the malicious address. Yes. Okay, since we still have time, I want to. I would like to briefly int introduce a general mitigation bypassing in the uh, Linux kernel. Uh, this is a joint work with my friend Wei Wu. Linux kernel is one of the most uh, security critical components in the world. Many mitigations across different levels have been designed, implemented, and enabled to harden the kernel. At the very beginning, attackers would corrupt the kernel, corrupt the code pointer or the function pointer to hijack the control flow to a malicious shellcode prepared in the user space. The shellcode consists of instructions for privilege escalation. To mitigate this attack, the Linux kernel introduces SMEP on Intel to block executing user space code in kernel mode. Attackers then choose to corrupt the data pointer to re refer to a fake object prepared in the user space. Through the corrupted data pointer, the adversaries hijack the control flow by dereferencing the malicious function pointer in the fake object. Considering this exploitation approach, the ad developers further introduced SMAP, or Intel, for defense. The name of this defense is PAN, on ARM. Now the adversaries ha cannot take advantage of the user space. Therefore, they turn to the kernel space, injecting the shell code in FizzMap, which is the right top part which maps all the physical page. The name of this attack is return to DIR. The Linux kernel circumvents this by not allowing code executing, execution in the face map. Then the adversaries have no choices but to make, the, make use of some guarded functions like call user mode helper, which forks a process and uh, runs a given executable. The adversaries can provide a malicious executable for the guarded function to launch an attack. And I learned this exploitation approach from the blocks of Google Project Zero, and it was quickly mitigated by the developers using a whitelist. Only executables in the whitelist can be loaded and executed. Another common exploitation approach is to hijack control flow to the function native write CR4 to disable SMAP and SMEP so that traditional attacks such as shell code injection and, a fail, uh, and a fake object confusion can be used. However, this is also mitigated by using virtualization-based hypervisor. So far, many exploitation approaches have been proposed and lots of them are mitigated. Is it possible to have a new exploitation approach that is that is general enough to bypass all these mitigations with only control flow hijacking primitive. Return-oriented programming is promising. However, the problem with ROP is it only works for stack overflow, which corrupts the return address on stack. Can we do ROP in kernel space 
regardless of the vulnerability types? The answer is yes. We proposed a general mitigation bypassing approach, which is roughly divided into four steps. In the first step, we will obtain the control flow hijacking primitive. As long as a vulnerability gives us this primitive, we don't restrict the vulnerability type. In the second step, we fork one hijacking into two hijackings via kernel gadgets, which we call bridging gadget. The bridging gadget has two indirect jumps or indirect calls. We use the first hijacking to direct kernel execution to a disclosure gadget, which begins with invoking copy to user function. As, as SMAP and SMEP is temporarily disabled during copy to user, we can leak stack canary to user space without triggering any defenses or kernel panic. For the second hijacking, we use it to direct the kernel execution to a stack overflow gadget, which begins with invoking copy from user function. SMAP and SMEP is also tempor temporarily disabled during copy from user. We copy the ROP payload plus canary leak it in the first hijacking to the kernel stack. In this way, the, the return address in the kernel stack is overwritten and return-oriented programming is conducted. Okay, so another demo is for the for the phone tree plus in the bypassing technique. Uh, also, it has several script and uh, we run the Go, sh Go script to boot up the kernel. And this time I recover the kernel and the kernel does and doesn't uh, print out the address. And logging the kernel using account user and uh, the password is one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> and before the exploitation, we print out the ID, which the UID is 1000, which means we are common users. And we run the exploit. And the exploit basically does the same thing as the phone tree demo. And build up, set up the environment and uh, do defragmentation and uh, allocate the vulnerable object, victim object, and uh, trigger the vulnerability and finally hijack the kernel execution and the bypass mitigations. After the exploit, you can see that the UID is zero, which means we are loot right now. And uh, GID is, uh, is a, is a <laughs> the, the GID doesn't make any sense because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a data, that, it's a malicious data. Okay. So in closing, I would like to summarize this presentation and draw conclusions. We identify objects useful for kernel exploitation to build a kernel object database. To eliminate side effects during exploitation, we proposed two algorithms to obtain, to obtain the desired slab layout. We evaluated our approach using 27 vulnerabilities and demonstrated its effectiveness. Okay, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Again, my name is Louis. You can follow me on Twitter or contact me using email. If you want to know more about me and uh, my other projects, feel free to check my personal page. And uh, I have already posted the demo video to the page. And uh, I'm actively looking for the next year's summer internship. So if you know of any suitable positions, please let me know. And uh, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, when you find vulnerable objects, both for um, heap shaping and 
um, the vulnerable objects that contain the pointers, the data mm -hmm. pointers, um, don't you have to group them into sizes because they have to reside in the same free list? Yes, cause like uh, the slab slab organize the objects based on the size or based uh, according to the type. So this is done in the static analysis because in the static analysis you can calculate the size of the object, right? Um, but when you showed the numbers, you told you found 27 mm -hmm. vulnerable. Um, right. Okay. Yeah, whatever. 124 of victim objects and four spray objects, but they don't have to be necessarily the same size or the same type. Yes, they are not of the same type, or it's just like uh, in total 124. And I, I didn't classify them into different types. So into different size. Yeah, so if, for example, a vulnerability can allow you to, do, to deal with objects of uh, some certain size that mm -hmm. doesn't have an, a matching mm -hmm. spray object. OK, what so, do, what do you do? so like basically from the size 8 to the size like 2048, for all these uh, different sizes, I, we find the objects for all of them. Right. And for some special. Special cache, because some cache is organized based on the type. And for some special caches, we find, because this is for a specific type, and we also find them. And the good thing is, like, the, kernel, the Linux kernel has a feature named uh, merge. And uh, the merge will merge a general cache with a special cache. So sometimes we'll find, like, even if it is, uh, it is claimed like a special cache, and af actually after kernel boots up, it is merged with a general cache. So for such kind of special cache, we also find uh, objects to exploit them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um one of the things that confuses me here is, is that you are building a database of all the slabs and their types and so on. Mm -hmm. From a user perspective, user lens perspective, mm -hmm. how are you doing that? I mean, you would have to have the right credentials in order to just go willy-nilly reading the whole memory management map. And So let me clas clarify your question. Is it like... Uh, that you are asking about the uh, user space allocator? Uh, what I'm basically saying is, is that all this happens in kernel. Yes. Um, which is very good. Um, I enjoyed the, 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 the idea behind it. Thank but, you. But from an exploiting point of view, mm -hmm. how would you do it without actually already hacking the kernel? So from a user land perspective, mm -hmm. where is the exploit? Because if I can do it from user land mm -hmm. uh, with those credentials to do what you're doing, mm -hmm. then there's a lot of other things I'd rather do. <laughs> yes, it's like, because uh, this work is, as you said, like it's based on the kernel, because we need to have a vulnerability in the kernel. Right. But for user space programs, I think if you want to deal with the function in the user space programs, you need to do some more development because the user space allocators have different features. OK, so, so what you're doing basically is pointing out the vulnerability within inside the kernel. Uh, this work is not about uh, discovering vulnerabilities. It's about how to exploit the vulnerabilities. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but if you were going to exploit it, you would exploit it from where, within the kernel? I mean, yes, the, the assumption is like we have vulnerabilities in kernel, and it, it targets kernel. So, of course, we, we, we do not exploit firmware in, at the kernel level. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to see where, mm -hmm. where, the, pay, where the gain is. I, I, I understand what you're saying, and mm -hmm. I see there's a vulnerability there, mm -hmm. and it should be fixed if it can, which would be in reorganizing the slab mechanisms and mm -hmm. so on, um, especially the defragmentation part of it. But um, I don't understand the gain. I'm trying to see if I was an attacker, mm -hmm. how I can gain this without actually building maybe dynamically loadable kernel objects, possible. Mm -hmm. But even then, I'd have to have the credentials to load them. And if I had the credentials to do that, 
then I'd go into other things that are more profitable, if you know what I'm trying to say, from an exploiting point of view. But if this is pointing out ex problems in the kernel, I think that's a good point. Yes, because uh, as a tackles in the user space, you can interact with the kernel using system calls. Right, so, uh, since we have identified objects as well as the system calls and arguments to operate them, you can use these system calls and arguments to like to indirectly influence the kernel execution and the allocated objects. It, correct, but mm -hmm. the system calls that I execute will be run in the context of the process that runs. Yes. And the context of the process will have credentials. Mm -hmm. And if those credentials are not root, mm -hmm. then they're not going to be able to do an awful lot. Yes, you are right. <laughs> so it's like uh, this is a process, this is another process, and it really runs in their own context, uh, respect respectively, and the actual, but the underlying the kernel, they like to respond to the user, user space program's system call by like to allocate the objects in the kernel space. And uh, in the kernel space, they share the cache so that you can use this, this such kind of stuff to influence the kernel's things. Yes. I hope I answer your questions. <laughs> okay, sure. <coughs> Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your great talk. Um, uh, the, in the last part, you uh, introduce uh, your technique to buy. You mean bypassing? Bypassing mm -hmm. mitigations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my question is, uh, in the last two years, uh, uh, Android Carlo and uh, uh, Apple introduced uh, some mitigation, like say if I were point mm -hmm. authentication to mitigate the ROP mm -hmm. IP attack. So, so how, how do you think about it? So are you asking about the PAC? Yeah, point authentication. Right. Because it's like kind of uh, control flow integrity protection maximum. And uh, this, this mitigation bypassing, the assumption of it is like we have a control flow hijacking primitive. Yeah. So if given a PAC, I don't think we can <laughs> bypass the mitigation. Yeah, so, so uh, I get confused if I can hijack the uh, control flow, in, uh, control flow uh, so I can uh, just, just uh, uh, set the, the uh, fail system the domain, the color domain of the process, and uh, I can use the uh, pipe to direct uh, read write the color, so mm -hmm. I can get the root process. I do not need to bypass uh, SMAP and SMEP because uh, color allowed me to do that. So what, what kind of exploitation can we, can you clarify a little bit? So, uh, so I mean, uh, here you can, Hijack the control flow, so I can uh, hijack a pointer to point you like a kernel socket, uh, uh, so socket uh, 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 control, and mm -hmm. I can set the the domain and the current uh, process of uh, to kernel, so I can uh, and ensure that it just set the ADDR limit to minus one, so I can read read write the kernel directly. You mean like uh, you hijack the kernel execution to a yeah, socket? So, so or? I, I, I don't mean I, I need to, to bypass the, mitigations. Uh, bypass SMAP and SMEP. Because like uh, our our goal is like to, we want to do ROP, which is because it's Turing complete and can basically do whatever you want to do. So this is our main goal. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. I get your point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much.